Okay. Um, if you have a question for Larry Wall, send out a tweet to pound sign TPCIP, uh, pound sign Ask Larry, and we might include your question in the Q&A session this afternoon. Um, now we have John Carr speaking on the uh, whole home audio solution with Pulsecast. Good morning. Thanks for joining me. So today we're going to talk about using the Linux sound system and some cheap single board computers to set up a whole home audio system. So we have an agenda. I had a problem. I had a solution. And then we have a recipe so that you can take my solution home and not spend lots of hours researching some of the nitty gritty details. So my problem, I have ethernet all over my house. I rewired the fucker. And of course, being an IT guy, there, there's ethernet everywhere, including my laundry room. I have several stereos around the house, and I would like to be able to have synchronized audio playing throughout the house. It would have also been nice to not have to change music player while I was setting this up. I was using something called Clementine at the time, which I still mostly use, although I've been looking at some other options, some of them MPD-based, uh, because Clementine development's been kind of slow of late. But uh, I still like Clementine, and as for a standalone local music player, I think it's awesome. Uh, a lot of it is, is, well, actually, the thing that's causing me to reconsider Clementine is that Koba is finally launched in the U.S. last month, and I actually am subscribing to a streaming service. So, total aside, uh, Koba's is the only streaming service that actually has a catalog of classical music, as well as they have always offered higher resolution than MP3 quality. So, between those two, it's like, it's a no-brainer. It's like, of what I listen to, what I want to have available on streaming the most is classical, because let's say I want to listen to some Telemann. Well, Telemann wrote like 3,000 pieces of music. Uh, some of the better known ones, there may be hundreds of performances out there. I may not, I don't necessarily want to buy 300 CDs worth of Telemann music, plus, each time you listen to it, you can listen to a different performance. So for classical, more than pop music, I, I find streaming particularly desirable. And I've been waiting for like three years for Kobas to finally launch in this country. So Clementine doesn't support Kobas. <laughs> and they're written in C++, which means I am not submitting a patch. So before I started, the way I built my solution that I had at that time was I'd create and save a playlist from a music player. I would feed the playlist to IceCast using the EasyStream utility. And then I had to connect a tablet or a computer to each and every device, use a browser to connect to that stream. It had some issues. First of all, there's a lot of steps here. It's not just like put some music into my queue, press play, and maybe go turn the downstairs stereo on. Every item in my playlist needed to be in the same format. So if I had FLAC, AUG, and MP3 in a playlist, If I decided I really didn't want to listen to 
something that was in the queue or I wanted or we were as a barbecue and we're talking and people uh, wanted to listen to Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders from Mars instead of whatever I had queued up next. Well, I had to go stop the stream, restart it, go back to each device connected and reconnect to the stream. It was, it worked, but it was kind of a pain in the butt. So a friend of mine suggested I look at Google Chromecast Audio, which has now been discontinued, but regular Chromecasts are still available. So the really cool thing is they were only about 30 bucks, which made it pretty expensive to get one to play around with. They are based on DLNA. It's kind of like Google has a proprietary extension to DLNA to power the Chromecasts. And the audio Chromecast has something which is a unique extension which allowed Chromecasts to be grouped. So you could have a Chromecast attached to every device in your house. And you could set them up to all be in a group. And when you cast to that group, every Chromecast would listen to it and play it. And that was pretty easy. But fortunately, the Chromecast has a whole bunch of issues. Number one right now, the Chromecast audio version has been discontinued, which means you can only find them used. Second, the, really the supported OS was Android. Uh, go figure that. Because you needed the Google Home app to get all the features. On other platforms, Linux in particular, they are really only supported way of accessing your Chromecast was through the Chrome browser. And then the audio quality is, this is a $30 device. They're, the audio, they're using a cheap audio chip. The audio quality and the electronics are very small, which also if, you, if you're if you into hi-fi, actually produces additional challenges for producing clean audio. So the sound quality is not terrific. It's not bad. It's like small devices produce surprisingly good sound these days, and the Chromecast was no exception there. But even when I had the Ethernet adapter, the Chromecast had frequent dropouts, and that was just too damn annoying. There was unofficial support for a number of things. So there was a side project, not part of Pulse Audio, called Pulse Audio DLNA, which could set up uh, access to a Chromecast. And then, of course, there's the built-in Avahi support that is a possible feature of Pulse Audio. Well, it is, there is a feature set. And VLC and the, in version 3.0 added direct support for Chromecast devices, but this was after I was working on this, so that wasn't really available when I was working at my solution. And one more pro is that you could connect it to an external DAC, but the dominant interface for external DACs, especially the less expensive ones, is USB. And you had to get a special Toslink cable because they use a non-standard variant of it that plugs into the same jack as the regular mini audio headphone type jack that it has. And you could actually feed it to an external DAC which gets around the sound quality, no longer a cheap solution. So anyway, it was a pretty decent attempt at an inexpensive consumer solution, but since it actually cost less than a decent sound card, they may have just been too aggressive on price to deliver a good product. So the next system to look at is a multi-room wired. This 
kind of system has been around since loudspeakers were first widely available in the 1920s. So these systems tend to be reliable, especially if you do a simple octopus configuration where you have a big receiver and you have like eight satellite speakers connected to it. But some big disadvantages, running a lot of new dedicated wire. So I have ethernet in my walls. I didn't pull speaker cable. If you reconfigure your system, you're not just plugging into the nearest ethernet jack, you're pulling more speaker cable. And your off-the-shelf systems tend to actually be pretty costly and at risk of obsolescence. So if we look at that system pictured there, that's a $1,500 system. It does come with an app that will let you use a smartphone to control it. But if the company goes out of business or discontinues that line, where's the support for your app? Uh, you have to upgrade it. You have to buy another $1,500 system. Well, if you're not reconfiguring, okay, you can probably reuse the same speaker wire, but that's another $1,500 system you're buying in six years. So when I was looking at this, Sonos was still pretty expensive. They've been coming out with less expensive solutions because I think they figured out that the days of being able to get sell $5,000 systems were done and they'd rather take advantage of their market lead. But they are still really proprietary systems and they're still not super cheap. Next system I looked at was Whole House FM. It's actually a really ch cheap system that would kind of work. But there are a couple of limitations. So you know that annoying characteristic where you queue up a bunch of music and the volume keeps changing. So that is a bigger problem in Whole House FM because you've got less than a CD's worth of available dynamic range, which means you have to set your level for the system, for the broadcasting side, based on the loudest things you expect to go through the system because if it overmodulates, it'll sound really bad. But the problem is with the limited dynamic range, it's going to trash the sound quality of the quieter signals. And the quieter signals are going to be closer to the noise floor. So unless you have something in place that's adjusting the sound levels based on the apparent loudness of the source before it goes to the transmitter, you're going to have audio quality issues beyond just the annoying fact of having to tweak the volume periodically as things get louder or quieter. So DLNA and Avahi are a set of standards for multimedia devices to communicate. Chromecast is based on them, was based, well, the, the Chromecast family is based on the, that standard. It's an extension to it. Most implementations only support one destination at a time, which for the object here is a big limitation. The Chromecast grouping extension appears to only have ever been implemented on the Chromecast audio and nowhere else. So there are a bunch of projects to make a Pi or something, or a Linux computer act as a device for sending media to consumer DLNA, Avahi type devices. But they all looked to be pretty limited sized projects. None of them had implemented any kind of means, as far as I could tell, of sending to more than one destination simultaneously. And I never really spend any time with them because it 
looked from reading the docs that none of them was going to do what I wanted. There are a couple of open source media center distributions that, again, might be nice but lack the ability to pick multiple DLNA destinations to put together a whole home audio system. VLC and M FFmpeg both have the ability to do streaming, but unfortunately it's single file streaming. So you can play one file, but you have to restart the stream to play the second file. Yeah, no. Could use internet DJ radio software. But the open source options I was looking at didn't see, it seemed like it was gonna be a major project getting them installed and up and running. So why can't we just capture a virtual sound card and stream from there? So in search of that answer, I started to look at the Linux sound architecture. And it turns out that Pulse Audio, which is the primary sound system these days, supports all of that right out of the box. Not very well advertised or documented, but it does. And in fact, the person who wrote the standard of AHI DLNA support is the author of Pulse Audio. So this gets us to part two, the Linux sound architecture and Pulse Audio. So there's a couple of pieces here to talk about. There's the open sound system, which is older. It's deprecated in Linux, but still used typically in BSD systems. The enlightened sound daemon, which is kind of dead. The advanced Linux sound architecture, Jack and Pulse Audio. And we're gonna talk about each of them a little bit. So also is kind of a uh, base layer. It supports audio interfaces from consumer cards to multi-channel things. It modulizes drivers. It's got thread safe designs. It's got user space libraries and it emulates OSS for software that hasn't been properly updated. So also is work, working at the lower layer to provide common interfaces to the hardware. So Pulse Audio and Jack are sound servers that work closely together with ALSA. So now we need the concept of a sound server. So the sound server, so you have a whole bunch of things in your system which are managed by ALSA that can accept sound or produce sound and in a few cases can even go both ways. The sound server is what ties everything together and directs traffic between them. Jack is a virtual patch panel. And Jack and Pulse generally play okay together. So you don't have to get rid of Pulse Audio if you're adding a Jack application. And uh, they, they, they generally don't manage to not step on each other. So Pulse Audio provides API and hardware abstraction, including networked hardware, which is really important for what we want to do. 
And most distributions have a working pulse out of the box. And pulse emulates ESD, which it effectively replaced, and provides interfaces to all your ALSA and hardware drivers. So Pulse is a user space daemon. It's got multiple configuration options. You can do it through the GUI, you can do it through the command line, you can edit configuration files. It was created by Leonard Podering, the creator of SystemD. In fact, the fact that he couldn't get it to run as a system daemon is what caused him to start getting interested in the init management process. So this is a diagram of what's going on with Pulse and uh, you can see that quite a lot is going on. Unfortunately, it's a vertical diagram and we have a horizontal little screen. Uh, how are we doing on time? Yeah, if people want to step up and get a look at that, or if you download the slide deck after the talk, you can. <laughs> you can uh, certainly take a look at the diagram. So, the sound server is actually a pretty complicated piece. So it's got some weird terminology. So first of all, each user gets their own daemon. And that's called a server. The client is the application that's sending data to Pulse. Sources are whatever generate sound and syncs are where the sound goes and gets emitted as actual sound. Generally, these things are managed through ALSA by Pulse. Front ends are applications interacting directly with Pulse. Modules are bits of functionality that can be added at will and can be developed outside the main pro Pulse project. So to work with Pulse, you'll mainly use the two graphical utilities, PA VU control and PA prefs from your desktop environment, and its sound control applet. However, if you're doing diagnostics or you're working headless as we will be, you'll need the command line utilities and there's example of output from them. And there we go. Uh, you guys want to look at the output a second longer. So this is all, you, you can download the PDF of the slide deck and, and look at it, stare at it to your heart's content. And actually you can use these utilities if you've got a Linux laptop, you can actually pipe type something like PA control list sync inputs and you'll get something very similar off of your system. So now that we're familiar with how sound works on Linux, we're going to put this together. So I mentioned previously that Pulse supports network stuff and Pulse can send RTP streams and, R and receive RTP streams and basically it just does this by default if you turn it on. So since I work primarily in the Debian world, I'm giving you Debian specific examples, but 
these are the package names you'll need on Ubuntu or Debian or Mint or anything else in that family. You'll want to fire up PA prefs and a couple of clicks because you need to enable the multicast sender and you want to create a separate audio device. This is also a great technique, even if you're not doing multi-room audio. So if you have a music player running by creating a virtual audio device, your music player can have that device and you can have the main sound card muted so that when you browse to that loud pornography site, you don't blow your speakers out. So that shows you that you have a new output device. Go to the receiving side. Now this is two Linux hosts that are running GUIs that we're working with right now. So if you have a desktop and a laptop, you can play along with this when you're at home. And again, it's just a couple of clicks to turn it on through the GUI. And then you can open up VLC and change the device. And with any luck, the media you're playing VLC will have the sound coming out of the speakers attached to the other computer. So if you want to see what it did, did, and this is one of the features I don't like about Pulse, is that there are three separate sets, of, three or more sets of configuration files. So each desktop environment has its own way of holding your Pulse Audio preferences, which is the last evaluated set. So on a GNOME system, you could look in the GCon folder and you can see what uh, is configured. The configuration directives in GConf will be similar to what we're going to see later, except they're all encapsulated in XML. And kind of like the example at the bottom. So, to build our home audio system, I took a Raspberry Pi, which is about the cheapest device you can find out there. A micro SD card. I used the Hi-Fi Berry DAC sound card. There are a couple other sound cards out there, but the at 30 bucks or so, the Raspberry Pi doesn't have very good sound built in. Yes, it has built in sound. But uh, since we're doing this for audio, it's worth spending more on our sound card than our, on our single board computer. You'll need a special case because the Hi-Fi Berry actually makes the Pi too high to fit a normal Pi case. If the, your first time you want to download the Raspbian Noobs installer, and here's some quick Pi setup steps if you don't know, and if you do know, just uh, check your email for a minute. You format your micro SD as FAT32. I use Gport head, download and extract Noobs, put it on the newly formatted micro SD. Attach your peripherals and network to the Pi. Install the Noobs micro SD. Pick the minimal install from Noobs. Make sure you switch to the US keyboard or you will not be very happy. And you can reboot when the installation is complete. Log in your first time. Your user is Pi, your password is, ra password is Raspberry. 
You'll use sudo ifconfig to get your MAC and IP address. Then you'll run the raspy config to config your Pi. You'll want to change that password. You'll want to set a host name. You want, need to enable SSH access because you are going to run headless and you do not want anything connected to the USB of a Raspberry Pi because one of the trade-offs for the super cheap device is that the USB and network share a bus and anything coming over the USB can interfere with your network stack. Then you're going to either reserve an IP in your DHCP server or set a static address outside the DHCP scope because you don't want this thing changing its address. And also this is a good time to run app get update and up get upgrade to get make sure you're on the latest everything. So then you have to edit boot config because you have to do some things to enable this the sound card and also turn off some stuff. So if you're using going to be using Wi-Fi, obviously you don't want to disable it, but if you're plugging in the Ethernet, get rid of Wi-Fi because why have unconfigured Wi-Fi on your system? Then you're going to shut it down with halt dash P, unplug it, remove the USB devices, but keep the network plugged in, and turn it back on. So now you should be able to SSH in with your new password, and you're going to add a couple of scripts. One is to start Pulse. Because you, Pulse is a user mode daemon, but there's no graphical environment to auto start it for you, so it will need to be manually started. And then you're going to create another one for reloading Pulse, so that if there's an issue and you want to restart Pulse, you don't have to think about it. And now you need to go to the configuration. So the actual config scripts are in Etsy Pulse. And we're not going to configure any per user scripts. We're just going to configure the system level scripts because ideally this would be running under system D as a service, but we're not doing it that way. Uh, because it needs a user session. So you have to make a few edits. Uh, I recommend adding an IP ACL so only the systems that you want to send audio from can send audio to the device. Uh, you need to make sure some modules are enabled and we're going to start Pulse from a screen session using RC local. So RC local is read at the very end of the boot process. And we're going to tell RC local to sudo to the Pi user. And this is this creates a logged in user environment that we can start pulsing. And our start pulse script will also cycle every 60 seconds and if pulse isn't running it will start it for us so if pulse crashes it will restart it so uh, i did have a minor issue of drift particularly uh, on the raspberry pi based player devices that the buffers would get out of sync. Some would have a longer buffer and some would have a shorter buffer. And the solution is just to restart pulse audio every once in a while. So pick a time when you're not listening, kill the pulse audio processes. 
you put that at Pi, the Pi users cron tab because they're who's running Pulse. You've got that auto that job run from RC local that every 60 seconds start Pulse. So Pulse will be down for a maximum of 60 seconds when you do this, but you'll fix the drift. And then this is a screenshot of my music player. And it's Android remote, which lets me take control of my playlist if without having to run back to the main computer that's running everything. And here's a couple of other options you might think about. So Snapcast, last I peeked at it, was not where it appeared to be usable unless you were actually interested in hacking the project. And I've been looking at some alternate players since, as I mentioned, Clementine doesn't support Cobuzz and isn't likely in the future unless I decide to learn C++ to do so. So here's some useful links. And the slide deck is available at techinfo.brainbuzz.org slash slides. And you can just look for the Pulse Audio slides. 